Again, I refer you to the booklet for a systematic overview of the differences, and especially to the software package, should you be in doubt as to your own score on this dimension. In the meantime, we have arrived at the fourth value orientation in our relationship with people. Diffuse versus specific, which has to do with the degree of involvement in a relationship. Let me introduce this fourth dimension by asking you a question. Imagine you are very tired and you have to take a flight. The stewardess tells you that you can choose your neighbor, either a Frenchman, a German or an American. Whom would you choose? Anyone, as long as it is not the American, because he won't stop talking. At least we are hospitable, whereas most Europeans are definitely not. Indeed, specificity and diffuseness relate to how we get to know other people. Specific cultures, like the Americans, have a very small intimate or private layer, which is well separated from the larger public layers. That public layer contains things which most Europeans would regard as private. An American will, for instance, easily lend you his car or let you into his fridge. But do not try to borrow the Mercedes from a German or to enter the fridge of your Dutch friend. One reason why American personalities are so easily accessible is that being admitted in one specific public layer is not a very big commitment. You get to know the other person for limited or specific purposes only. In contrast, diffuse cultures, like most Southern Europeans and Orientals, have such a large private area that it needs protection. That is why they are less easily accessible. But once you have been admitted to the diffuse private areas, there are nearly no more secrets. Specific cultures separate work and private matters, whereas diffuse cultures tend to mix them. Consider the following question. Would you paint the house of your boss in case he asks you and you don't feel like doing it? More than 95% of the North Americans and Dutch say they would definitely not do it. Compare that figure with the small 30% of the Chinese who wouldn't do it. This reminds me of a Dutch operator I once interviewed. He said he would not even consider painting his boss's house. When I inquired why not, he answered that it was not stated in his collective labor agreement. Can you be more specific than this? Let's consider some areas where the contrast between these two cultures is very sharp. The first one has to do with criticism and losing face. To this end, we go back to our meeting between the Dutch, one of the most specific Europeans, and the diffuse Italians. When the Dutch called the Italian idea crazy, the Italians heard themselves being called crazy. What the Dutch consider to be public, that is to say the idea at stake, is a private matter to the Italians. Their ideas are not to be separated from themselves. The danger zone is thus constituted by issues which specific cultures regard as public, but which diffuse cultures consider to be private. To call their idea crazy is to call them crazy. Specific cultures with their small privacy areas have considerable freedom for direct speech. If Americans get criticized during a presentation, it is likely that they will try to defend their idea without feeling insulted personally. This explains why brainstorming works so well in specific cultures. Americans put their brain easily on the table. If the idea is okay, even the better. If the brain is chomped into pieces, no problem, next brain. In diffuse cultures, where egos are big, people tend not to put their brain on the table. It is impossible for them not to take the criticism which follows a brainstorm personally. Listen to the following corporate case where criticism during a performance evaluation by a Western superior led to his murder. A Dutch physician evaluated his Chinese subordinate in a frank discussion about his shortcomings. In his view, they could easily be remedied by the company's training courses. Yet, to the Chinese doctor, who had worked closely with him and who regarded him as a father figure, the criticism was a savage indictment, a total rejection, a betrayal of mutual confidence. The next morning, he knifed his critic to death. It is easy to imagine the Dutch ghost protesting that he had never said his Chinese colleague wasn't a great fellow. It was only his medicine he was worried about. Another important area where the contrast pops up is timing a business trip. Imagine you have an interest for your product or service in Argentina and that you have come close to a deal. Now you need to fly over to finalize things. How would you proceed? 
I would make a well thought out presentation which would clearly demonstrate the superiority of my product. I would be careful not to waste their time and stick to a strict business agenda. I would first of all outline the history of a company to them. I would take a week to get to know my future customer. I would not do business with people as long as I don't get to know them better. Your reasoning matches the one most Argentinians would follow. The upfront investment in building relationships in South America is as important, if not more so, than the actual deal. Yes, but isn't that a horrendous waste of time? Both approaches claim to save time. In the diffuse approach, you do not get trapped in a relationship with a dishonest partner because you detect any unsavory aspects early on. In the specific approach, you don't waste time whining and dining a person who is not fully committed to the specifics of the deal. As an American, you select one element of your personality for your counterparts from the rest. But more diffuse nations will refuse to do business in a mental subdivision called work, which is kept apart from the rest of life. To them, everything is connected to everything. They may wish to know where you went to school, what you think of politics, art, literature and music. This is not a waste of time because such preferences reveal character and form friendships. They also make deception nearly impossible. Specific cultures are very direct, get straight to the point, to the objective aspects of the business deal. They are very purposive in relating. Doing business with people more diffuse than yourself will therefore look very time consuming because they are extremely indirect, circuitous and known for their seemingly aimless forms of relating. This brings us to a third area in which the contrast is striking, namely internal communication. Specific cultures are very precise, blunt, definite and transparent. They will start with the executive summary and make bullet statements. Do not beat around the bush, please. More diffuse personalities are evasive, tactful, ambiguous and even opaque. Their communication is very high in context. You start with Aristotle on page 1 to explain inflation in Ireland on page 26, if you're lucky. This is the sense you get when you compare the Wall Street Journal with its many bullet statements with the more philosophical and circuitous Le Monde, the French elitist newspaper. A British manager once told me that he got furious when introducing a new bonus scheme. To introduce the system into the Netherlands, he wrote a fax to his Dutch counterpart in the following style. We suggest to introduce a new bonus system of the following nature. After three months, he realized that the Dutch hadn't been very active in getting the system going. Not to say they didn't do anything. He got quite alarmed, British understatement for enormously furious, when he heard why. Obviously, we didn't start introducing the scheme because it was just a suggestion and we didn't like it. Another difference regards the use of titles. When I graduated in the United States, I was introduced during the reception following the graduation as Dr. Trompenars. However, the next day at a party at the house of my tutor professor, I was introduced as Fons Trompenars. It shows that a title is a specific label for a specific person, in a specific job, at a specific time. Once that changes, your title changes too. Compare that to the German Herr Doctor. You are not only Herr Doctor at the university, but Herr Doctor at the butcher. And even if you come home, Frau Doctor says, Good Abend, Herr Doctor. Herr Doctor replies, Good Abend, Frau Doctor. Where are the little doctors? A title in Germany is diffusely integrated with your personality. You do not have a title, you are a title. A fifth difference between specific and diffuse cultures is their mobility and turnover of staff. The specific relationship is the result of high mobility and results in high mobility. I have observed full-time expatriates who developed a specific type of personality. How can you remain mobile if you involve your privacy in a relationship? Impossible. Diffuse relationships result in low mobility. The only way to achieve mobility here is to move the whole family, so the relationships keep on being respected. The British have solved it with the British club around the world. Going local was one of the greatest sins. Diffuse cultures also tend to have less turnover of staff because of the loyalty and the multiplicity of human bonds. They tend not to headhunt or lure away people from other companies with high, specific salaries. These examples illustrate that personal involvement 
rating from specific to diffuse, is perhaps the area in which balance is most crucial, from both a personal and a corporate point of view. The specific extreme, to keep business separated from the rest of life, might lead to superficiality. So we must recognize that the integration of different aspects of one's personality can deepen the relationship. Yet we need to retain perspective in order not to compromise privacy and business. The effective international manager must avoid collision between the two at all costs and realize that business is business, but that stable and deep relationships mean strong affiliations. This dimension is undoubtedly one of the more important explanations of cultural differences. We have thus arrived at the fifth dimension in our relationship with other people. Achievement versus ascription, which has to do with the meaning we assign to other people. If I had walked into this room saying, Hello, I'm Franz Trompenaars, I'm 39 and father of three daughters, Lisa, Faye and Gaia. I have two sisters and a brother. I have a degree of the Free University of Amsterdam and obtained a PhD from Wharton, the University of Pennsylvania. What would you have thought? Who cares? You never mentioned what you actually do here. Exactly. This dimension of achievement versus ascription explains how we assign status to other people. All societies give certain of their members higher status than others. While some societies accord status to people on the basis of their achievements, others ascribe it to them by virtue of age, class, gender, education and the like. The first kind of status is called achieve status and the second ascribed status. While achieve status refers to doing, ascribed status refers to being. My imaginative intro was based on who I am rather than on what I do. But in the American dream, status is built on what you do. It doesn't matter who you were or are. The American dream is the nightmare for the French. You start from scratch and on the basis of what you do, you become a millionaire. It is nouveau riche for the French. The French would rather be ancien pauvre than nouveau riche. Let's examine some of the areas in international business where this dimension plays an important role. The first is negotiating. It can be extremely irritating to managers of achieving cultures when an ascriptive team of negotiators has some eminence grise in the background to whom they have to submit any proposals or changes. It isn't even clear what this person does. He, usually male, will not say what he wants, but simply expects deference from everybody. It is, of course, equally upsetting for ascriptive cultures when the achieving team wheels on aggressive young men and women who spout knowledge as if it were a kind of ammunition to which the team opposite is expected to surrender. To them, it is like having to play with a toddler and a toy gun, a lot of noise coming from someone who is of no known authority or status. Sending whiz kids to deal with ascriptive people who are 10 to 20 years their senior often insults the ascriptive culture. The reaction may be, do these people think that they have reached our level of experience in half the time? That a 30-year-old American is good enough to negotiate with a 50-year-old Greek or Italian? Closely linked is the actual meaning of status in both orientations. In ascriptive cultures, it is important to tie in your status with your organization. Indeed, your achievement as an individual will be discounted compared to the status your organization ascribes to you. It is therefore important to say not just that you are a manager, but what you are a manager in charge of. Marketing, finance, human resources or sales. Many a deal has been lost in Latin or Oriental cultures because the representative was not seen to have high status back home. Ascriptive cultures must be assured that your organization has great respect for you and that you are at or near the top. In ascriptive societies, the role of titles is quite different from the use of it in achievement-oriented cultures. In the latter cultures, you tend to ask first what you studied and afterwards you might be asked where. In ascribed societies, they first ask where you study. Only in case it was a lousy university for saving your face, they will ask what you studied. If it is Oxbridge or the Ecole Polytechnique, the second question is often forgotten. 
Another area where this dimension causes a lot of misunderstanding is staff appraisal. A Swedish manager was managing a project in Pakistan. A vacancy had to be filled and after careful assessment, he chose one of the two most promising Pakistani employees. Both candidates were highly educated, with PhDs in mechanical engineering, and both were authorities in their field. Yet Mr. Khan was selected on the basis of some recent achievements. Mr. Saran, the candidate not chosen, was very upset by the turn of events. He went to his Swedish boss for an explanation. His boss tried to make him understand that only one of the two could be chosen, for there was only one vacancy. He made no progress. Eventually, he learned that Mr. Saran received his PhD two years before Mr. Khan from the same American university. Saran was expected to have more status than his colleague simply because of this. His family would never understand. What was this Western way of treating a scribe's status so lightly? Should more than just the achievements of the past month be considered? I know a young female marketing manager who worked for an American company in England. She was so successful that she was named the most promising female manager. This vote of confidence influenced her to accept an offer as director of marketing to her company's subsidiary in Ankara, Turkey. Working as hard as she could over the first few months, she found her authority gradually slipping away. The most experienced Turk, Hassan, who was 30 years her senior, informally but consciously took over, getting things done where her own efforts failed, although his marketing knowledge was only a fraction of her own. She had to watch him exercise influence, which often led to unsatisfactory results. She learned that the head office was complicit in this, communicating more and more through Hassan, not her. I suppose her story can also be explained by the fact that Turkish culture is much more ascription-oriented than achievement-oriented. Indeed, cultural preferences often have the force of law. Refusal to send young women managers to Turkey because they are young and female may be illegal. Yet to send them is to confront them with difficulties which they will not be able to surmount through no fault of their own. A better tactic may be to make someone young or female an assistant or advisor to native managers. They will make up for any deficits in knowledge of these native managers while using local seniority to get things done. Such a posting could be paid in the same way as being chief in an achievement-oriented culture. You cannot replace Turkish with American cultural norms if you seek to be effective in Turkey. This will not be effective in the long run, and in the short run, it can be very expensive. But as I said, I do believe in the reconciliation of the two orientations. Those who are achievement-oriented are convinced that we need to appreciate and reward what people do and achieve on the basis of their skills and knowledge but they will agree that valuing the last performance only leads to instability. Hence, they should try to understand the conviction of ascription-oriented cultures who respect who people are on the basis of their experience and past record. But ascription-oriented cultures should also understand that we cannot be hindered in our achievements by not challenging the status quo and that we should therefore reward people on the basis of what they do as well. The middle the international manager must try to hold is the respect for what people are so that we can take better advantage of what they do. We have now discussed five aspects of culture that affect the relationships among people. But relationships among people is just the first universally shared problem to which different cultures have devised different solutions. Let us now discuss the last two dimensions of culture and start with our relationship to time. To coordinate our business activities, we require some kind of shared expectations about time. The time agreed for a meeting may be approximate or precise. The time allocated to complete a task may be vitally important or merely a guide. The notion of time also expresses the importance cultures give to the past, present and future. If you ask people to draw the importance of the past, present and future by means of three circles, you get interesting differences across cultures. Americans have relatively big presents and futures, while their small past seems to be detached. The Japanese have similar sizes, but they are more integrated. By asking this question, we look at two aspects. The first is size, which is the more easy to interpret. It indicates the importance of the dimension. Be careful, however, because the length of time is not taken into consideration in these circles. The Japanese and the Americans may have similar sizes for past, present and future, but this does not mean 
that they have the same opinions of what short and long terms actually mean. When the Japanese were negotiating to take over Yosemite National Park in California, they submitted a 250-year business plan. The initial American reaction was, gee, that is 1,000 quarterly reports. The second aspect the circles illustrate is the relationship between the three time dimensions. One is either sequential, so there is no or little overlap of circles, or one is synchronic and the circles are integrated. If our view of time is sequential or monochronic, we see time as a series of passing events. If our view of time is synchronic or polychronic, with past, present and future all interrelated, ideas about the future and memories of the past both shape present action. Everything has its time and place as far as the sequential thinker is concerned. Any change in this sequence will make the sequential person more uncertain. Try jumping a queue in Great Britain. You will find that orderly sequence has very stern defenders. Everyone must wait his turn. First come, first serve. It is part of good form. In a butcher shop in Italy, I saw the butcher unwrap salami at the request of one customer and then shout, who else for salami? This method serves more people in less time. At my local butcher shop in Amsterdam, the butcher calls a number, unwraps, cuts and rewraps each item and then calls the next number. Once I suggested, while you have the salami out, cut a pound for me too. Customers and staff went into shock. The system may be very ineffective, but they were not about to let some wise guy change it. The synchronic method, however, requires that people track various activities in parallel, rather like a juggler with six balls in the air. It is not easy for cultures who are not used to it. Likewise, people who do only one thing at a time can, without meaning to, insult those who are used to do several things at the same time. The South Korean manager explained his disappointment upon returning to Holland to see his boss. He was on the phone when I entered and he raised his hand slightly at me. Then he rudely continued his conversation um, as if I were not even in the room. Only after he finished his conversation, he got up and greeted me with an enthusiastic but insincere, Kim, happy to see you. I just couldn't believe it. To a synchronic person, not being greeted spontaneously and immediately, even while talking on the telephone, is a slight. The whole notion of sequencing your emotions and postponing them until other matters are out of the way suggests insincerity. You show how you value someone by giving them time, even if he or she shows up unexpectedly. Sequential people tend to schedule very tightly, with thin divisions between time slots. It is rude to be even a few minutes late because the whole day's schedule is affected. Time is viewed as a commodity and lateness deprives the other of precious minutes in a world where time is money. Synchronous cultures are less insistent upon punctuality. American time scheming strikes them as aggressive and seeking to use customers as stepping stones to personal advantage. If the relationship is genuinely to last, what is the hurry? In sequentially organized cultures, there is a heavy emphasis on deadlines because they signal the end of one link in a causal chain and the beginning of the next and keep you on schedule. Once again, we find that differences in time orientation are not truly alternatives, but are capable of being used in conjunction. Future-oriented cultures will get the present into focus by relating it to a desired future. But visions need to be realistic. So cultures who are past or present oriented will build the present of their business upon the learning of the past. But it is quite clear that we should not simply repeat the past, but relate the present to a desired future. The wise cross-cultural manager will hold the middle by developing clear plans which lead from current competences to a new vision. In the booklet, there is an entire chapter on the different meanings various cultures assign to time. I have completed these meanings with tips for managing or doing business with cultures of another time orientation than your own. If you would like to put your own time judgment to the test, I warmly invite you to fill out the questionnaire in the software package. Let's now turn to the last dimension of culture, our relationship with nature. This dimension concerns the role people assign to their natural environment. 
societies which conduct business have developed between two major attitudes towards nature. The first of these orientations is inner directed. People here believe that they can and should control nature by imposing their will upon it. For this kind of culture, the organization is like a machine that obeys the will of its operators. The second orientation is outer directed and believes that man is part of nature and must go along with its laws and forces. This kind of culture tends to see an organization as a product of nature, owing its developments to the nutrients in its environment and to a favorable ecological balance. The issue of inner versus outer directedness becomes very interesting when compared with the results of the next pair of statements. What happens to me is my own doing. Sometimes I feel that I don't have enough control over the direction my life is taking. On this basis, a number of countries appear almost completely internalized. In the USA, for example, 77% of managers believe they control their own destinies, as do 61% of the West Germans. The other extreme is countries like Japan and Venezuela, where only 38% and 35% believe to have control over the environment. In this context, remember that death is an option for the Americans, like having a pure face. If it is not okay, you need plastic surgery. For the British, who are relatively more externally oriented, God didn't make mistakes in the first place. Language ability is highly related to locus of control. Inner directed cultures control the environment and expect the environment to adapt to their language. Americans or Brits are unlikely to speak Japanese, for instance. But the Japanese, who are outer directed and thus feel that they should adapt, will try hard to speak other languages. Our Western contention that Asians steal our ideas is shaped by our notions about what comes from inside of us and is therefore ours. Asians regard Western technologies as part of the environment, like fruit on a tree, which wise people pick and incorporate into themselves. To take something from the external environment and then refine or improve it is not copying but celebrating that environment. The difference between inner and outer directedness is well shown in the attitude of sportsmen. An American wrestler will say, I do not care who my opponent is, I'm strong enough to beat anybody. The focus here is internal. With my increased strength, I will beat the other. Compare this to the martial arts of the Oriental culture. Strength is important too here, but for a different reason. The strongest is the one who takes most energy of his opponent to his own advantage. We should not, however, make the error of assuming that inner direction and outer direction are exclusive options. All cultures necessarily take some notice of what is inside or outside. To fail to do so would lead inner directed cultures into a headlong rush to disaster, while outer directed cultures would try to please everyone and dissipate their energies by overcompliance. The inner directed manager is never happier than having won over other people to his or her own way of thinking. They hold that we should focus on things we are good at and persuade our environment to accept them. This is known as technology push. But they also know that there needs to be a market for what we produce and that we need to respond to the environment and to the needs of the customer. This is known as market pull. Still, we must not just want to be at the mercy of the forces around us, but lead them, which again closes the circle in which the middle is held by the international manager's capacity to ride the waves of opportunities and by taking advantage of existing forces and not contradict them. The most competitive international companies are those who can combine the strength of both push and pull factors. Now that we have discussed the seven fundamental aspects of culture, it may be more obvious to you why we have to be careful in claiming universal applicability of most management and business techniques. Let me conclude with a case that reflects the cultural dilemma clearly. A US-based company decided to introduce a pay-for-performance scheme for their salespeople. The best salespeople got the opportunity to double their salaries. It was successful enough to introduce a similar system in Europe. Although there were more introduction problems, the system became nearly as successful as in the US. It was then decided to expand the system to the Middle East. After an initial success of three months, sales dropped to an unprecedented level in Iran. How come, you think? 
The Iranians needed money too. That's why it worked well the first three months. Yes. But why did it collapse afterwards? Perhaps uh, the Iranians didn't yet have the experience or what could go wrong. After the experience in the first quarter, they might have realized their culture protested this universal system in which sales are the objective criterion for the larger income part. This threatens the particular obligation of a boss towards its subordinates. Very good. One individual is playing against another. This internal competition might threaten the collective efforts of the group. Furthermore, the quarterly basis of the system might lead to a retrace that threatens the long-term commitments to the clients. Right. The achievement-oriented bonus could also lead to a situation in which the subordinate earns more than his boss. Such a situation is likely to be avoided in Iran. Also, the Inshallah, or externally controlled Iranians might say, Thank you, Allah, for helping me to hire sales. Whereas in an internally controlled society, one is more likely to say, Sales went up because of me or my efforts. But if sales go down, Inshallah might be said after all. Okay, it's clear that this pay-for-performance system is failing the Middle East because of culture. But what can we do about it? I would not advise you to try to explain to the Iranians what the merits of a pay-for-performance system are. Such a centralizing approach might lead to serious corporate rain dancing. Neither would I advise to leave the introduction of the remuneration system to the local subsidiaries, as a fully-fledged decentralizing approach would suggest. I don't get the point. You say we should neither centralize nor decentralize. I thought you should consider either one or the other. No. All I'm saying is that the only reason for centralization is decentralization. This type of thinking leads us to the roots of reconciling the cultural problem. The question is really, what do we need to centralize and what do we need to decentralize? My general answer would be, centralize the philosophy, increase its quality and decentralize its application. The higher the quality of your philosophy, the easier the decentralization of its application. That sounds easier said than done to me. What would this mean in the case of pay for performance system? This philosophy didn't work in Iran. I don't agree. Pay for performance works everywhere, but different cultures assign different meanings to what is pay and what is performance. But what does this mean in practice? It means that the American company ran into trouble because the quality of its philosophy was just not high enough. If they had looked at the philosophy behind the pay for performance system, they might have reasoned, what we need is a system that motivates people in a certain direction, in this case, higher sales. So why not say that the budget for pay for performance should be a variable 50% of the salary budget and that it should be given to the best salespeople according to a forced distribution at least once a year? This leaves the Iranians the freedom of turning it into a group bonus once a year. This principle works well across cultures. It's like a pendulum. The bottom of the pendulum swings better if the top is fixed. Centralize the philosophy, increase its quality, and then decentralize its application. Let's take a look at two cases in point that illustrate this message in two entirely different ways. The first one is Benetton. Luciano Benetton said, we are not advertising with lifestyle approaches because our products are too dependent on fashion and culture. Therefore, we have centralized our philosophy of human diversity. This allows us to be flexible at the bottom. Benetton thus uses a wide range of human diversity applications in its ads all over the world. But the meaning people assign to these posters is again quite different from one place to the other, which is exactly what he's aiming at. Heineken, on the other hand, wants its beer to reflect the centralized message of guiding the process from stress through relaxation, being a genuine no-nonsense beer, targeted towards the high end of the market. Therefore, they decentralized their advertising activities to the local experts and ended up with totally different clips for the same beer in the UK, Greece, Italy, and so on, which all reflect the same centralized philosophy, but in a way adapted to the culture in question. So, the general principle holds that the only reason for centralization is decentralization, just like the only reason for differentiation is integration. This very presentation has hopefully shown that a central message of global quality can incorporate many local interpretations and applications. I hope this message will help you in your future assignment, and I wish you good luck.